Good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, thanks for bearing with us over these weeks and uh, complying with COVID, masks and all, and social distancing. At least it allows us to move together, doesn't it, and be together in, in a fellowship. Uh, and that's, that's precious. But a warm welcome to those who are joining us via the live link. Uh, it's coming to you from the Whittlesey Christian Church in the heart of the beautiful fens. Flat as a pancake, but it's lovely. <laughs> Amazing skies. If you've never visited, come one weekend and join us. It's a vibrant, exciting church family, and we'd love to verbally, if we dare, welcome you, but we can't. I, I wouldn't even try to do that. Our folks would break every COVID rule in the book on volume. <laughs> so we're just saying you're welcome from the whole church family this morning. But now due to COVID, a uh, uh, normal type of celebration, Christmas celebration, uh, has had to be drastically altered. And, um, and we hope that that will be uh, acceptable to you. We've done the best we can. Um, to stay compliant, and but let's celebrate Jesus together, shall we? And we're going to sing that great old carol. And uh, unfortunately, carol. No, I don't need. To. Oh, hey! I'm being told to take my face mask down. I dare not take it off completely. We are allowed, incidentally, to be without face masks at the front while we're singing. But because I'm going up and down, um, I'm going to have to slide it up and down. So bear with me. No, I haven't got a sore throat. <laughs> I'm not bleeding. <laughs> oh, come, all you faithful. Oh, 
may take your seats. Maria, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you all in the house of the Lord. Yes, it's different this year, many changes, but hey, you know, at least we can celebrate this yeah. glorious morning. Yes. Just to remind ourselves of the true meaning of Christmas, which is to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are going to be treated to a puppet show now. So I'm going to hand over to the puppet team. It will be obviously with a, with a Christmas theme. There's not really a puppet team actually because of social distancing, but you'll be amazed at what, um, at what the puppet presentation will be this morning. Mm. Okay, I'll hand over to the puppets.
Wasn't that just beautiful and amazing? So we're now going to sing another carol. So you can join with us on this one. in the Bible about the birth of Christ, let us read from Luke 2, verses 8 to 14. On the night when Jesus was born, there were shepherds in the field, keeping watch over their flocks. Suddenly the angel of the Lord came down, and the glory of the Lord shone all around where they were, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I am bringing you and all people good and joyful news. In the city of David, our Savior, Christ the Lord has been born. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the child wrapped in baby clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a multitude of the heavenly host joined the angel in praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill 
toward all humanity. That was just the beginning, wasn't it? That was just the beginning of the life that would bring us life and new hope. And on that note, we're now going to have um, a video presentation of the children's slot. Um, they've done a, a song and a, and a short presentation, so over to them. Before the children sing today, I would like to read this, the living word of God, to bless all who were watching. God's great love to all of his children. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not die but live eternal life. Peace on earth to everybody. Luke chapter 2 verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace, good will towards men. We hope you enjoy our song written by Kate Ross to share all the good news of God and his love to all of us. Long time to go to sleep, isn't it? Eh? Just How can you sleep. go to sleep through that? Eh? No, that was wonderful. Hey, kids, you're tuning in. Thank you so much. Bless your heart.
You know, when, as a child, I used to sing this carol until I went away from God. And, um, but some years ago, I, I was fiddling about on the piano. And I thought, you know, this needs uh, a different rhythm. It had no rhythm, really, but it needs a kind of a rhythm. And, uh, and, and of course, I, I was involved in a certain type of music at the time. Uh, and so it got reflected in the song. I hope you'll like it. Okay, my life's not going to be worth living after this. Okay, Kate. Oh, wow. You know what? It's a good job God's got a sense of humor, isn't it? If he hadn't, he'd be looking at us going, oh, my goodness. Did I really create them? Okay, so back to the reason for the season, Jesus. You know what, boys and girls, mums and dads, everybody who's watching this morning, you know, there is a reason for this season that we're in, and it's Jesus Christ. And, you know, there's been so many times during history when he's, uh, you know, the enemy has tried to take him out of the picture. And, you know, we see that more and more, don't we, as time goes on. But that's to do with the end times. We haven't got time to talk about that this morning. But um, as the children's worker uh, that I am, and having a team that helps me to organise all the children's work and put in a lot of hours. I thought it would be really fun. And let fun be the word you think of when you see this next video, because we're not a professional choir. But what we wanted to do was to bring the truth, because teachers want to bring the truth, don't they? Especially if they're working on behalf of God, of um, the meaning of things in the Bible, in this song. So we're going to now introduce the 12 days of Christmas and the true meaning Hello everyone, welcome to the rendition of the 12 days of Christmas by the Lighthouse Gang Children's Wakers, G-Man, Kate, David, and Maggie. And here we go, Kate. On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a partridge in a pear tree. A partridge in a pear tree representing Christ dying for us on the cross. Did you know 
that a partridge is the only bird that will die for its young, just like Christ died for our sins. Over to you, Maggie. On the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. The two turtle doves representing the Old and the New Testament together making up our Holy Bible. Over to you, David. On the third day of Christmas, my true love sent to me Three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Pop, pop, pop. Three French hens indeed. Here we prefer our Anglian hens. They are those representing faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these, according to Apostle Paul, is love. Yes, over to you, Kate. On the fourth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. The four calling birds representing the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They went out to pronounce the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Over to you once again, Kate. On the fifth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me... Five gold rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. The five golden rings, very expensive, representing the first five books of the Old Testament. Over to you, Maggie. On the sixth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me six geese a lion, five gold rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Right, the six geese a lion, representing the six days that God created the entire beautiful universe. Wow! Over to you, David. On the seventh day of Christmas, my true love sent to me seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying, five gold rings, four calling birds, three friends, hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. The seven swans are swimming. So graceful if you've seen the swans swimming, representing the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Over to you, Kate. On the eighth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me eight maids are milking, seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying, five gold rings. Four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Right, the eight maids are milking. Must have been quite smelly in that barn, I guess. Representing the Beatitudes, because our Lord Jesus Christ loved the poor. Those are the blessed are they. Right, over to you, Kate, once again. On the ninth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Nine ladies dancing, eight maids are milking Seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying Five gold rings, four calling birds Three French hens, two turtle doves And a partridge in a pear tree The nine ladies are dancing Representing the fruits of the Holy Spirit That come from deep deep, deep within us. That is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Over to you, Maggie. On the tenth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me ten lords a leaping, nine ladies dancing, eight maids a milking, seven swans a swimming, six geese a laying, Five gold rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Ten lots 
slipping right representing the Ten Commandments, those ten rules that the Lord God Jehovah gave to us for living right with him. And over to you, David. On the eleventh day of Christmas, my true love sent to me eleven pipers piping, ten lords are leaping, nine ladies dancing, eight maids are milking, seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying, five gold rings. Four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Wow, guess what the eleven pipers are? Those were the eleven disciples that were left after Judas betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ. So there were just eleven disciples left. And finally, for the twelfth gift of Christmas, Kate... On the twelfth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Twelve drummers drumming, eleven pipers piping Ten lords are leaping, nine ladies dancing Eight maids are milking, seven swans are swimming Six geese are laying, five gold rings Four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves And a partridge in a pear tree the twelve drummers drumming drrr, representing the twelve doctrines, our beliefs as Christians, what we stand for. So I hope you have all enjoyed our not so musical, but mm, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. That is what is important. Our twelve days of Christmas rendition, and we want to say to you all. I think it was a note of wisdom <laughs> that um, excluded me from that. I'd have been forgetting a three. <laughs> oh, oh, praise God. In a few moments, a resident poet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, for the end of COVID. <laughs> Our resident poet is going to come. But before then, there's a lovely song. And it's the first Noel. Isn't this a great old carol? Hope you like the back.
those songwriters certainly knew how to put verses in, didn't they? Okay, let's take our seats. Christine. Am I on? Oh, every year the writing gets bigger. <laughs> <laughs> My arms get shorter. Look how long it is now. Used to fit onto one page. <laughs> oh, but am I supposed to be facing the camera? I forgot that. Oh, well, what strange times we're living in, aren't we? Um, you know, with this pandemic or epidemic or COVID, or corona, whatever you like to call it. But it's got me thinking of all the different names that we call everything. And um, obviously... The Lord has lots of different names. So this poem um, is actually called The Names of the Lord. And it's some of the names that we cling to. As this year draws to its close, I don't think it will be missed. As we think of those we haven't hugged, the loved ones we've not kissed. How strange these faces covered how odd to stand apart when instead of celebrations, we've just had meetings of the heart. But I lift my eyes to Jesus, God's own beloved son, and read again his promises, the victories he's won. I read of how he's with us always. Emmanuel, that's God with us. And take comfort in his presence as the whole world makes a fuss. I marvel that the King of Kings takes care of you and I and stand firm upon the cornerstone as the madness passes by. He's guided me as a good shepherd when I seem to lose my way. He has shown himself as Prince of Peace, as turmoil held me in its sway. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, praise you, Lord. We thank you, God. I've heard him whisper softly, wonderful counsellor is he. I have trusted that he is the word, and what he said I know will be. He's shone the brightest morning star through days that seemed the darkest yet and to cling to him our own true vine always seemed the surest bet God sent him as Messiah to that stable long ago fulfilling the predictions given to those in the know he is Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end the Holy One the prophet, lamb of God and closest friend. So, in this year of sorrows, when things will never be the same, I will lift my eyes to Jesus and I'll praise his holy name. You know, it's truly been a very difficult year for many, many people. And uh, who knows what is yet to come. But through it all, there's a beautiful song um, I used to sing. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all. I've learned to depend upon his word. Aren't you glad that we have a saviour that we can trust? Amen. The group are going to come right now. Amen. And we're going to sing a song that came out a couple of years ago. 
called Hallelujah. Father, we want to thank you for who Jesus is. We want to thank you that you receive our praise and our worship today. Amen. 
Praise God. for a few moments. You know, we've listened to so much this morning and so many things are changing in our world. We look and we think, are things ever going to be the same again? And one of the greatest problems that we're facing is the enormous fear that has been instilled into people. If 78 years of life have taught me anything, it's taught me that you do not change anything through fear. That's why Jesus said that perfect love casts out fear. He said fear brings torment. And yet one of the greatest problems that people have and that we will yet have to overcome is the residue of fear in whatever depth it has settled in people's lives. But regardless of how things are changing and how people are learning to adapt, I couldn't get away this week from that very familiar and almost quoted off by heart, the part that we know. And it's that John 3.16. And as I began to look at that, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Despite any questions people may have, those questions can find some answer through love. The Bible says that God does not have love. If you have something, you can choose whether to use it or not, can't you? But he didn't say, I have love. He said, God is love. He is love. He cannot go anywhere. When you are something, you cannot go anywhere. I am a man. I don't care whether I'm in a pit. I don't care whether I'm in despair. I don't care whether I'm with a crowded room or on my own. I am still a man. Because that's what I am. And it never changes. God is love. And so despite everything else that we are facing, we are yet to face, there are three questions that I saw because most people, when they either preach on or repeat John 3.16, that's about all they repeat then I began to see something very, very different. And I want to share it with you. Three questions from that section, not that particular phrase, but three questions that are there in that saying of Jesus Christ. It is, the first question was, why did Jesus have to come? Why? Why did God have to leave and see his own son publicly humiliated, publicly flogged like a criminal, despised, rejected by his own people? Why? Did a loving father have 
to send Jesus. You see, Jesus didn't have to come, did he? He really didn't. He could have said, hey, make your own way through life. But he didn't. God so loved the world. That's why Jesus came. It wasn't just to work miracles, to heal the sick, to restore sight to the blind, to take those who had lost their way in life and give them some sense of direction. The joy of, in the midst of all the pressures of 50 years in the ministry. One of the greatest joys is to see people that without God intervening in their life, who knows where they would have been. I still to this day, that must be 40 years ago now, encountering William, a man from Scotland, who was the town, the city of Ripon's troublemaker, known by the police, sleeping rough. Nobody wanted to know him. He smelt. You didn't want to get near him. To society, he was a reject. I didn't know that. I'd gone to Ripon to hold a series of meetings in a hall that I'd rented. And as we were holding an open air in the city centre, and different people began to take part. I, I, I was playing the music with my piano accordion at the time and, and um, I couldn't get my eyes to my right just about where Stephen is now. To my right, leaning up against a lamppost, was this man, disheveled. I couldn't get, I couldn't stop looking at him. And when that happens to me, one day, somebody's going to come up and hit me. Because I, I get transfixed with the person. As, as I think, what does God want to do with them? And, and I felt such an overwhelming love for William. I discovered his name was. So I, I knew that I got a break for about 15 minutes before I was required again. And I walked up to him, and the closer I got, now I hate smells, I really do. You wouldn't think it when I used to cut up pigs for a living, 100 pigs a day, before I could go home. And I, 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 I thought, God, I can't, I can't do this. I wanted to vomit because of the smell. He must have not had a wash. Goodness knows how long. And I stood as close as I could to him. And I said, sir, I've got a message for you from God. God loves you. He stood upright, backed away from the lamppost to step, and he said, nobody loves me. Or, forgive me for calling you a liar, but if you knew me, you'd know how much I love you right now. Because quite honestly, sir, you stink. Hey, I was bred and born in Staffordshire. We say it how it is. But we don't hold grudges, huh? unlike sometimes around here. Um, <laughs> uh, 
And I said, I cannot stand smells. And humanly, all I want to do is be sick right now. And I put my arm around him and I hugged him. I said, William, I love you. In God's name, I love you. Then I was needed. Unknown to me, that night he crept in to the meeting at the back. And I went at the end of the service to shake hands with folks on the way out. I said, oh, lovely to see you, William. Oh, he said, I'll be back. The following night he came back. And he, somebody came up. I, I, we were worshipping God. And I, I, I was just lost in worship as I played the songs and... Somebody came, tapped me on the shoulder and said, I think you need to open your eyes. And there was William, kneeling down at the front of the platform, sobbing his heart out, saying, I want to find Jesus. I want to find Jesus. I discovered that this man had lost his son in Scotland, taken his son out for a walk, his son had run off, but sadly, he'd run off in the direction of what appeared to be a gentle flowing brook, but it was actually a fast flowing stream. Fell into the river and was washed away and never found. And William hit the road, couldn't cope. Nobody knew that because nobody had taken the time to talk to him. But you see, God so loved. There's no one outside of that love, no matter what they've done. God doesn't care what humanity has done. He only cares what his son has done. To rescue them. I had the joy of pointing William. To the Lord right there. He stood up smiling. And I went back on the platform. And chose another worship song. I didn't bargain on what was coming next. This disheveled man. Stood on the chair on the front row and if you've ever watched Last of the Summer Wine anybody? <laughs> watched it? you know what sort of compose handkerchief looks like hmm? COVID <laughs> not COVID compliant I hasten to had I stood on that chair faced the congregation sang with all his heart out of tune took his hanky out of his pocket and waved it and I stood there playing thinking germs, germs, germs <laughs> but you know a couple in the church took him home gave him a bed and a meal and a bath only to find that the following morning when he went out to find a job he was clean, he was tidy, went to look for work. They went in to tidy the bed and it hadn't been slept in. When William came back, they, re they said, why? And he said, I, I, can't. I, I, I can't. Now, now he'd had a bath, he was perfectly clean. He said, I can't sleep in a beautiful, beautiful white bed like that. I can't, I can't sleep on sheets like that. I'm dirty. And they said, no, you're not. Don't ever do that again. Your, that bed is your bed. We want you to sleep. Within a couple of days, the chief of police in Harrogate 
<coughs> came with a big file. He'd heard what had happened to William, how his life had turned around in a matter of days. And he said he wanted to meet with me and William because he couldn't understand. So we sat in this person's house where he was staying and he opened <coughs> this file on William. And he said, what's happened? And so I told him. Yes, he says, I've heard from the local police and they don't know what to do with him now. And he looked at William and I still hear those words coming from him. <clears throat> he said, William, and with these words he closed the file and put it back in his briefcase. He said, William, if you keep on doing what you're doing, he said, I don't profess to understand but that is not the William we know. But if God's given you a chance and these people are giving you a chance, I'm prepared to give you a chance. That file will stay closed. Never be opened. Unless you go back to your old ways. We're giving you a chance. And you know, that's what the love does. That's why Jesus came, to show how much God loved every miracle he did, every word he ever spoke, whether it was hard to understand or whether it was hard to listen to, was spoken from a heart of love. Time and time again, we read that phrase, don't we? He was moved with compassion. If you were translating that into modern English, English that people are familiar with, you would literally say this with the Greek words that are there. His guts ached. His guts, he ached in his gut, deep inside. This was more than pity. It was compassion. And he was moved. He ached with compassion. So that's the first question that this beautiful scripture answers. But how much did God love humanity? How much? Let's carry on. Verse 17. How many know that verse 17 comes after verse 16? Hey, if you want to understand verse 16, read where it's going. And it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, not the Jews, not the Greeks, but the world, every single living human being in the world, wherever they are, might be made whole. Body, soul, mind and spirit. Amen. King James uses the word saved, which in Greek is sozo, which means to be made whole. Body, soul. Mind, spirit. Because Jesus came. How much did God love us? He loved us to look on us, no matter what we had done. If we were sick, he wasn't just interested in our body. If we were rejecting Jesus Christ, he wasn't just interested in our soul. He was interested in our emotions, our will, our mind, 
Every single part that makes up you and me as an individual. That's how much God loves you. I recall right now a meeting I was in many, many years ago in, in Canada, this was, I believe. It was, I think it was Canada I was in at the time. And God was showing me through the gifts of the word of knowledge many people's different ailments and situations and they were coming out getting healed. It was an amazing evening. Unbeknown to me was a little old lady that was sitting to my left. And she came hobbling out. And she'd been sitting there listening to all of the precise details of people's problems coming out. And, and she was saying to God, Oh God, I wish that I had a major problem with my knee. But all it is is a little pain, a stabbing pain when I kneel down. To pray, and I love to kneel down to pray. And she said, It sometimes disturbs me. But, but it's nothing really, I suppose, to, to all of these other. And she said, I couldn't believe you suddenly began to describe. Uh, uh, well, uh, I tell you, I didn't believe it either. <laughs> because in the midst of all this, something dropped into my spirit. And God says, there's someone in this meeting tonight that has a little pain in their left knee. I want to heal it. Now this church had never seen or heard of the gift of the word of knowledge. They didn't believe it. And I thought, oh come on God. You know, if I were to take a census and say, how many of you have got a little pain in your left knee now? <laughs> you know, I said, probably half the congregation. I think they're going to say, oh, this is pure guesswork. But I couldn't get away from it. And so I thought, well, let them think what they want. I'd lost my reputation years ago and the worry of it. And I gave it. And she said, I can't believe that God is interested in my little pain. You know what? God took it. Like he took the big ones. The major ones. He took it all. And she was free. That's how much God loved us. That's the third, second question. What's the third question that it raises? We have to carry on, verse 18 and 19. We ask the question, if that was true, what you've just said, why Jesus came? How much does God love me? Do I always feel 100% absolutely convinced that God loves me? No, I'm human. Unlike people who say to me, oh, it's all right for you. You're a preacher. Oh, yeah. I looked at one person when they said that. I said, have you ever tried telling people what they can have when they don't want it? <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> I said, try it someday. No, I... I am human and there are times when I look up and I think, God, do you really love me? If you love me, why? If you care for me, why? I made the great mistake once of talking to the pastor of a church that I'd ministered at many, many times and I was under so much intense pressure at the time. It was unbelievable. And I couldn't, I just could not find a way through to the answer. So no, I don't always have the answers 24-7. <laughs> huh? 
I'll get them, but I don't always have them right away. And after the meeting, he started talking, and I thought, oh, I'll just share with him. So I shared with him how, how I was feeling. I've never forgot the look on his face. He was horrified, absolutely horrified. He said, Brian, oh. he said, I, I, I don't know what to say. He said, we didn't invite you here to come with problems. We, we invited you to solve our problems. Huh? And he said, you're a man of God for goodness sake. And I thought, what's that got to do with it? Huh? I'm not a man of God. I'm a man who loves God. And you know, that taught me that sometimes to be careful who I share my problems with. And over the 23 years that I traveled, I discovered that times to share your problems were few and far between. And hence, you learn to sadly work through them yourself. This is why at the heart of this house, as long as I have anything to say in the matter, at the heart of this house will be family. At the heart of this house will be love. At the heart of this house will be forgiveness. At the heart of this house will be the Spirit of God. You see, God loves us so much, he wants our company. I don't know why God put his hand on my life. I was a rogue. Angry. Hit first. Asked questions when they got up off the floor, whether they were male or female. You wouldn't think this placid individual could be like this, would you? <laughs> I wish I hadn't been. But I'm glad. I went to church one night, not to find God, but to prove somebody wrong. I didn't go with good intentions. You've probably come with better, far better intentions than I went to church. Purely to win a bet. That's all. I lost. No, I found. <laughs> That's how much God loved you. That great apostle Paul said, didn't he? I am the worst of sinners. The worst. You wouldn't think it reading his writings, would you? But it, it says there, those who believe on him, if that's true, why does God seem so far away at times? Ever been there? When it seems that God is anywhere near where you are or within listening distance to your heart or your voice. But it says those who believe on him are not condemned. They're not condemned. It's those who do not believe that are condemned. You know, condemnation all it does is it leaves you under a cloud of hopelessness. God will convict us when we are wrong. I've learned to give up on trying to convict people. I don't preach to convict people. That's God's job. 
not mine. I overstep the mark when I try to do that. God convicts. But conviction and condemnation are very similar, but they're poles apart. Both make us aware of wrong. But conviction, when God convicts you, he turns you to what is the answer to the situation you're in. He said, I don't want to keep you. He said, he has taken us out of the kingdom, the domain of darkness, and he has translated us into the kingdom of his son. His big problem with the religious Pharisees was he said, you lay burdens on people, but you never offer to lift them with one little finger. You're like whited sepulchres. White on the outside, full of death and dead men's bones on the inside. Hey, Jesus didn't mean words. I, I, I'm convinced he was born in Staffordshire. <laughs> but he said, condemnation, on the other hand, only makes you aware of wrong. Doesn't focus on the right. Leaves you under that cloud. So, if you're under a cloud of guilt this morning, then think again about who's causing you that guilt. Because God doesn't leave you under a cloud of hopelessness. He lifts your eyes, doesn't he? Oh, I am so glad. But yes, God does seem far away sometimes. Because there's a plan. I think God had to allow me to get as desperate as I did. He had to do that. And he said, and this is the condemnation. The light, this is why they're condemned. Because they don't believe on me. They're condemned because light has come into the world, but they choose darkness. Rather than light. Because their deeds are evil. They don't want to get rid of them. You see. And he talks about the word condemnation. At the end there doesn't he. And this is the condemnation. And that word. All through that scripture. The word that is used for condemned is a beautiful word in Greek. It's called um, kino. Kino. Krino. But condemnation <clears throat> is talking about crisis. We, we get our word crisis from it. It's, it's the word crisis. Spelt exactly the same we spell it, except with a K instead of a C. But it talks about a tribunal that arrives at a judgment, a sentence, but a tribunal. You see, one day we will all stand before God and have to answer for our lives. And that's what he says. He said, this is, this is the tribunal. This is what will happen at the tribunal. Somebody said, I don't believe in a God of love. Why would a God of love send anybody to hell? I said, I don't believe he does. Oh, so you don't believe in hell? Oh yeah, I believe in hell. I said, but I believe in what God says about hell. Not what others. I said, 
God said, I don't send anybody to hell. You send yourself. God can't look on sin. And there's going to be an eternity very soon. The world cannot continue in the direction it's going without destroying itself. As the Bible has predicted. And one day, eternity will begin. And God said, in that city that I've prepared for you, there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, no more evil, no more wrong, no more hurt. God, will reign supreme. But the tribunal will sit and the books, the Bible says, will be opened and our life will speak for itself. Don't worry about what people think about you. Worry about what God thinks about you. Because at the end of the day, it is not the opinion of people. And I've seen people destroyed by the opinions of people. Left emotional, mental wrecks. I've got a song I wrote while a lady was, and with this I'll close. I was in Denmark. And the pastor had taken me to visit this lady that had been sent into an insane institute. And it was the most demoralizing experience I've ever witnessed. I wanted to hug that lady. I wanted to shout to the guards, get out of the way, I'm taking her home. And that is not because Denmark is a beautiful country and the people are beautiful. I spent many, many years in meetings over there. But it was the attitude in those days to mental problems. And as I walked, we prayed for that lady. I was still in Denmark when the news came. I was just about to leave when the news came that they had finally released her. Because from the day that we prayed, they could find no reason for any treatment at all. And I'd got one day left when I was, somebody had offered me to go to uh, their beach house and spend the day and the night before I left the following day, just to take a day off to chill out. And the pastor of the church said, would you please come and take a meeting on your final night? this lady is going to testify. And she started to talk about we had no sooner left her cell, her prison cell almost, straight-jacketed, padded. No sooner did they lock the doors and she said, my heart began to cry unto God. And she said, Suddenly, a presence came through the door. And it was a beautiful man. And there was such an aura 
of holiness, but love around him. And he walked over to me and he said, I have come to make you whole. And he touched me. And as quickly as he came, he left. And from that moment, her insanity and mental issues began to subside until they could find no justifiable reason to keep her there. And while she was giving this testimony, I, I, I wrote a song. In bondage, I was held by Satan's heavy chains. There was no Freedom to be found, I forget the words now. It was about three or four verses long. And, and all I could do was cry, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And my chains were loosed. And I was free at last. Restored back to her family. Just like the man in the tombs of Gadara that the Bible talks about. Restored. Jesus may seem far away, but I'll tell you there's a promise he gives you right now. And it is that I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I am with you. You cannot get away from God you can't he'll be there you can reject him you can spit in his face you can curse him you can do what you want to him I've done it all believe me <clears throat> I was the last one that was worthy enough to be saved my own sister oldest sister now the others have died. I said, Brian, if you stay a Christian for 12 months, I'll follow you. Well, she's yet to keep that promise. I keep reminding her. <clears throat> but you know, I couldn't get away from God. The night I went home, and told my parents what had happened to me, God-fearing people. My mum took one look at me and she said, Son, the worse you got, the more I prayed. As far as I was concerned, you were coming back to God. I don't care how bad you got. You broke my heart. But you never broke my faith. It was just a matter of time. And there will come a moment when God will break through on your life. No matter how you feel right now, God is there. Father, we want to thank you that you do not condemn us. You may disapprove of us. But your disapproval is absolutely bathed in love. And you love us back to yourself. And I pray that wherever people are right now who may feel at wit's end, I pray that this little excursion into John chapter 3 will have lifted their spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. I trust you have a wonderful Christmas. Now, I, I, I rarely do this. I don't think I've ever not suggested we don't have a meeting. 
But I'd like to propose that because Christmas Day is on the Friday, Sunday's only two days away, it would be helpful to me and to Maria, I'm sure, if we could have a, a lovely break. We uh, haven't had a break at all this year. The last holiday I took was last September. And so it would be nice to have Christmas and the new year. Uh, now, I've always been happy to do whatever the people want. And I, I sincerely mean that. And so if you would like to meet, I would be happy to do so. So now here's the crunch. You decide. How many want a meeting next Sunday? Okay. Okay. We get a break. Praise God. But we look forward to seeing you the Sunday afterwards. Have a wonderful Christmas and know that we love you as your shepherds. We love you and want to serve you. God bless you and despite the fact that I'm on a break as always I'm here to help if it's important. Don't hesitate to ask. Okay? Because if I find you haven't, I will have a, a problem with what I used to be. <laughs> God bless you. I've got a message. Silent night. Oh, yeah. Do you want another carol? Yeah. Okay. Let's close with it. As Brian's getting ready, can I remind everybody that Christmas Eve at 4 p.m., I will be hosting a nativity from the church. Richard's going to um, air it live. So if you've got children that are interested in a nativity, 4 p.m. Christmas Eve. Yeah.
the Lord bless you. Thank you for being part of our celebration today. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Oh, can I remind you to stay COVID compliant? You came in the front door, but you must go out through the back. Thank you. Bless you.